Our reading today is from Colossians 3 verses 1 to 10. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. Colossians 3, 1 to 10. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for, your, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put your, to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourself once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourself are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created you. <coughs> Last week... We commenced a new series on the book of 1 Samuel with Paul Hall. Paul and I swapped last Sunday, and what I was going to bring to you that Sunday, I'll bring today, but it was in a lead-up to what Paul has to talk to, to us about from 1 Samuel as we do that study. So today I want to take us on a journey, scanning the book of Judges, which does lead on to 1 Samuel. But first, I want to just take a step back to Joshua as he summoned the Israelites together and declared to them, You know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one word of them has failed. In the back of your mind, I just want you to remember that verse from Joshua 23 as we scan the book of Judges. What happens when Israel forgets their God? The book of Judges takes us on a journey through Israel's downfall spiral. Judges is a book about violence, bloodshed. It isn't the kind of book you would expect in the Bible. For some people would say it would incite religious violence. Shouldn't we move away from this type of thing? Why is it included? Why do we need to include such stories from the past? This book highlights the human condition that man's need is for a saviour and the journey continues beyond judges to the only one who can deliver us from ourselves. The theme of judges is the assimilation of God's people, the Israelites, by the pagan cultures that surrounded them. These pagan people were broadly referred to as the Canaanites. The Canaanites' assimilation resulted in Israel's losing all of their uniqueness of God as God's people, God's nation, to such an extent that you could not tell one from the other. Judges was a time when no one was in control, for the people did what was right in their own eyes. Nothing anyone did was wrong, in their own eyes that is. The history of Israel is a history of ups and downs. The history of the, the rest of the civilization is no different. History is repeating itself. They say that a generation, a great civilization, lasts for about 200 to 300 years and a, a sequence of events takes place during that period. These event, events are a cycle and it begins from a period of when a nation is in bondage. And out of bondage comes spiritual awakening. Great faith rises within, in the nation. Look at our own nation, Australia. We came from a time of bondage as convicts sentenced to transportation. And during our early history, men of God, like Richard Johnson, a chaplain on the First Fleet, built a church proclaiming God's sovereign love to the people of the First Fleet, both convict, the bonded, and the free. A spiritual awakening came about, and our nation became a nation from this Christian heritage. God's hand, like that of God's people, the Israelites, was upon us. 
However, it doesn't end there. From spiritual awakening, spiritual revival, comes great courage. Look at some of the early explorers, the inhabitants of the land, our indigenous people who lived here under harsh conditions, venturing beyond their known community areas. Our own early explorers from the first fleet and others who came after them. The explorer Charles Sturt, for one, nearly died in the centre of this great land and turning to God, praying for guidance and a way forward from out of peril. Others followed. Over 100 years ago, this land became a nation, built on Christian values. God's hand has shaped this land of ours. Throughout our little history, men and women of faith have influenced our godly foundation and given us that Christian heritage. From courage comes liberty, from freedom from the society of oppressive restrictions imposed by rulers who dictate our way of life on our behaviour, on our views of society. And from the liberty comes abundance, prosperity of life, a quality of life. Then from our prosperity of, or abundance comes leisure. Leisure is a whole new way of living. The opportunities and the availability to do what we want to indulge ourselves. This then leads to the next step in the cycle of civilization. We become selfish and intolerant of others. We lack consideration and only thinking of our own selfish and gain and pleasures. The cycle continues from this selfishness and intelligence to a position of complacency, a feeling of smugness or, or uncritical satisfaction within oneself or on, on our own achievements. It can't, continues and leads to apathy where we lose interest and concern lack of emotion and indifference. Just for example, we had our local election here in town and throughout the state. I'm just wondering, did you take time to look at who the candidates were? Did you look to see what their policies were? What they believed in? What they wanted for our town? Or did you just go along and just vote because that's the way you've done it all the time? We lack motivation to stand up for what is right, what we believe in, including God. And from complacency to dependent, dependent on those around us, for others to supply our needs. Our independence becomes dependent. That leads to weakness, the loss of skills, loss of vitality, the loss of knowledge. Look at the world today. How much does Australia produce? How much is Australia reliant on other countries? Look at the world today. It's the same there. We rely on others. I'll give you an example. We at one time built cars in this country, like the, the Ford, the Holden, Toyota, Mitsubishi. We don't do that anymore. We have to import these vehicles. And you know what that's leading to? To bondage. Back to where we started. We become reliant, bonded to others to supply our needs. And this bondage brings servitude. We come back to where we were in the first place. Look at some of the great civilizations throughout history. For instance, the Assyrian civilization with the city of Nivida an ancient Assyrian city of Upper Mesopotamia, noted for its sculptures, architect, literature, law, astronomy. Modern Assyrians as uh, Suri Kak, Christians, who claim descendants from Assyria, one of the oldest civilizations of the world, dating back to 2500 BC in ancient Mesopotamia. Then we have Egypt. With all its splendour, the vast empire, the pyramids which we see, the, see today in ruin, to its downfall through God the Almighty. And the Greeks, with all its philosophy, its wisdom and many other things it has left for the world. But the mighty empire is no longer around. Then we have the Roman Forum 
Italy the political, economic, cultural and religious centre of ancient Roman civilization. Its ruins still visible today in modern day Rome. We do know from prophecy that Rome will rise again and out of it shall come the Antichrist. There are many more civilizations that have come and gone over time. Many were very wealthy and influential throughout the world. They left a legacy even till this day. What is true for secular earth is also true for spiritual earth. The history of God's people has not been exempt from this pattern. The book of Judges does not give us a very pretty picture of how God's people prospered. No, Judges gives us a true account. Warts and all, the good, the bad and the ugly. Nothing is held back from us. It's a dismal picture. It's dark. It's depressive. Not a book to curl up on a stormy night and to bring comfort. It will, however, bring nightmares. This book shows us the depravity of mankind. The book of Judges is the seventh book in our modern Bible. There was no indication of who authored the book. However, Jewish tradition, as well as the uh, Talmud, a collection of 3rd and 6th century writings that covers the full gauntlet of Jewish law and tradition, tells us that Samuel wrote the book of Judges, and also the book of Samuel, till his death, at which point the prophets Nathan and Gad picked up the story from, there, from where he left off. Today, we are not going to look at the trees and the shrubs, but the whole bush, or as many of you would say, the forest. The highs and the lows of God's people. The name Judges is self-explanatory. The judges we are talking about are not the judges we know today. Like, the, like Judge Judy of television fame, or like the, our own courts here in Australia, for instance, the uh, Supreme Court of New South Wales or the High Court of Australia. No, these judges from the Book of Judges are different. Nothing like what we have today. These Old Testament judges were warriors, delivering the people from oppression and bondage. They did not sit in a court to judge the people in legal proceedings, though at times this did happen. These judges, as mentioned, were warriors, but at times they were, he or she were a counsellor, a priest, a prophet. But at no time were these Old Testament judges in theoretical overseer of litigation. The Old Testament judge was often a rugged individual. For example, Gideon, who was raised as a fighter, rolling up his sleeves and fought the notion that the place is that placed Israel in bondage. He was a deliverer. There are around 15 Old Testament judges. The book of Judges covers around 300 years, three centuries of misery for God's people. A miserable course of seven cycles, even though God tries to bring the nation together as an example to the world. The people had other ideas and chose to walk in another direction from God's will. God's people turn their back to God. Let's compare two verses, one from the book of Judges and the other from the book of Joshua. In Judges 1.1 we read, Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall be first to go from for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? Let's look at in comparison as we read Joshua 1.1. 1, 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Notice these two verses? They are obituaries. In Joshua we read, Moses had died, and God placed Joshua in charge. And then in Judges, all we have is the death of Joshua. When a man of God dies, nothing of God dies. Man dies, his impact dies with him. But God's impact, his influence remains with us. With Joshua, we have victory, and in comparison with judges, we have defeat. 
It continues motivation to fight compared with maintaining the status quo. The people are mobilised compared to the people being in revolt and rebellion. And then the people are in unity and determination of spirit compared to the people being in disarray and weakened in spirit. A generation of fighters, whereas under judges, they were a generation that didn't know how to work together, let alone fight for a cause. And finally, a people who were patriotic to a nation of indifference. During the time of judges, Israel was a nation in turmoil, both politically and religious. The people tried to continue with the work of Joshua, for the land had not been fully conquered. The people fought against each other, the tribe against tribe, and in the madness, this indifference of God's way, they nearly wiped out the tribes of Manasseh and Benjamin. The pattern is clear throughout the book of Judges. The people rebelled, idolatry and disbelief brought God's judgment through foreign oppression until God brought forth a deliverer or a judge and the people repented and turned back to God. This became a cycle for Israel. The people repented, God delivered and then they turned their back on God. Time and time again this happened. Each time a new cycle commenced and God came to the rescue. He raised another judge. We meet so many heroes of faith. For example, there's Othniel, the first of the judges. Then Edad was, left, was a left-handed warrior. So left-hand people are not from the devil. Might not always be good, to, but used by God in a mighty way. Being left-handed helped him to hide his blade in secret. He is described as a judge who was sent by God to deliver the Israelites from Moabite de de denomination. He was succeeded by Shemgar, the third judge of Israel, whose actions led to peace for an unspecific time. One verse summarises his period of leadership. After him, that's Edad, was Shemgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad and he also delivered Israel. Then we have Deborah, a prophetess of God, and the only female judge mentioned in the Bible, who was the fourth judge. Judge 4, 4 denotes that she was married, the wife of Lapidot. Then we come to Gideon, a mighty leader, judge, prophet, whose calling and victory over the Midianites. He was also a coward, hiding in the wilderness, trying to live a life without being noticed by Israel's enemies. Even after coming face to face with the angel of the Lord, being told that he, Gideon, will lead Israel to, 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 uh, into the, uh, deliverance, Gideon doubted God's word and power. He tested the Lord in every step of the way, but God delivered him to overcome by faith. And then you have Japsar, a judge for six years. He lived in Gilgad, uh, Gilead. Like his father, his mother is described as a prostitute. Jephra was the 18th judge of Israel. He is one of the most encouraging and at the same, the most tragic of the judges. He was a warrior against the Amorites. The tragic part was that he made a vow to God that if the Lord gave him victory over the Ammonites, he would make a burnt offering of the first thing he saw coming out of his house after the war. In those days, the Jews often kept animals stabled in a ground floor enclosure with the, the family lived on the second floor above them. We have all heard the sad repercussions of this vow. For the first thing that did come out of that house was not an animal but his young daughter and only child. The Bible tells us that he kept his vow. It doesn't say whether he sacrificed his daughter or whether he consecrated her to God as a perpetual virgin, which meant either way he would have no family line. And that was a disgrace in ancient times. Then we have Samson, 
the most famous of the judges. He's a recognisable figure and he came before the institution of the monarchy. He was a Nazarite, yet he broke many rules of the Nazarite vow. God gifted him with great strength to aid him against Israel's enemies, the Philistines who blinded and enslaved him. We often recall Samson from the Cecil B. DeMille 1949 film Samson the Liar and all his faults, violent, uh, revengeful, and most of all pride, we see as his weaknesses, we also see his humiliation and defeat. But Samson called out to the Lord, and God had not forsaken him. God restored Samson's strength. We can learn a lot from Samson. For instance, don't abuse any gift God has given you. The consequences of sin does catch up to us. And when we're at our lowest, God is there waiting for us. And then we have Eli, the second of the last of the judges of Israel, who was succeeded only by Samuel, before the rule of the kings of Israel and Judah. And we learn from last week with Paul, he was a high priest of Shiloh, but not necessary in the role to serve the people of God. Even his offspring were scandals and had no respect for the Lord. These are few of the judges of Israel. Each accomplished great things. However, their weaknesses result in Israel returning to the cycle of, cycle of turning their backs to God once again. The theme of judges is failure to by compromise, depravity on display throughout the 21 chapters of Judges. We need to stop and listen to what God is saying to us through this book. <coughs> in Judges 17.6, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And Judges 18.1, in those days there was no king in Israel. And in those days, the tribe of Danites was seeking an inheritance for itself to dwell in. For unto that day, their inheritance among the tribes of Israel had not fallen to them. And Judges 19, 1. And it came to pass in those days, there was no king in Israel, and there was a certain Levite staying in the remote mountains of Ephraim. He took for himself a compromise from Bethlehem in Judah. And then Judges 21, 25. Therefore there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Can you see the common theme throughout these verses? There was no king in Israel. And everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Does that remind you of something? A prosperous society doing their own thing. It feels good. Do it. No one in control, no authority, no accountability. People can always justify their actions. I know it reminds me of another civilization. Just look at today. It's not my fault. It's the way I was brought up. Or it's how society treated me. You owe me. The world owes me. Never taking responsibility for one's own actions. They are justified in their own eyes. Is this old book not relevant to our own time? Why did these people fail, especially after God raised men and women to lead them? Look at Joshua. Look at what he told the people before he died. This land will be yours, for the Lord your God will himself drive out all the people living there now. You will take possession of their land, just as the Lord your God promised you. The people are in the land. Each tribe has been given a portion. Joshua told the people to continue with the battle, to drive out the Canaanites. Why? Make sure you do not associate with the people, these other people, still remaining in the land. Do not even mention the names of their gods 
much less swear by them or serve them or worship them. Rather, cling tightly to the Lord your God as you have done unto now. Cling to God. Hold fast to the Lord. Nothing about associating with other nations. Quite the opposite. Therefore, take careful heed to yourself that you love the Lord your God. Take heed. Be careful. Don't be complacent. Drive these people out of the land which the Lord has given you. Why do they fail to do what they were told to do? Little by little, by not being on top of things. For instance, a weed in the garden. There's only one. And that and it, and it gets and if you don't do anything straight away, there are two. Then there's three. And on it goes until the whole garden is a mass of weeds that kill your garden, kill the plants, kill your crop. Look at our coastline in the weather in which we've had recently and in the past with the king tides washing away, eroding the land of the coast. If we don't do something about that, then the tide will encroach further inland. Erosion will prevail and there'll be nothing left. This is what was happening to Israelites. This is what is happening to our society today. We become complacent in the little things, and it grows. And before we know it, sin has entered. We turn our backs on God. Just look at what is happening in the world today. What God has made quite clear is a sin, is an abomination, is justified in our world today. And it's taking over every level of society. Who are the unjust today? It's not the sinners, but it's those who seek to do what is right in the eyes of God. The Israelites had come to continue the fight of their ancestors, drive out the Canaanites and free the land of Israel from their influence before it was too late. But did they? No. Now, after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall be first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? They were not prepared to be the first in line to do the Lord's bidding, to be obedient to God, even after all that the Lord had done for them. And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Indeed, I have delivered the land into his hand. The tribe of Judah was commanded. So the Lord was with Judah, and they drove out the mountaineers, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland, because they had chariots of iron. The Lord was with Judah, but wait for it. Watch for the erosion. They could not drive out the people of the valley. Why? Who gave them the iron chariots? God did. Don't you think that God had a plan? That he knows the weaknesses of those people. But the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jesuits who inhabited Jerusalem. So the Jesuits dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. They don't do what they were told. They are still there to this present day. Disobedience lasts, is felt for generations. However, Manusa did not drive out the inhabitants of Bethshin and its villages, or Tarnak and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor or its villages, or the inhabitants of uh, Iblim and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages, for the Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. Again, disobedience. The Israelites became complacent. They compromised. And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites under the tribute but did not completely drive them out. They made the Canaanites slaves. The Israelites putting them to forced labour. Notice throughout the land the Israelites were, excuse me, were disobedient. In verse 29 we read neither did Ephraim and verse 30, neither did Zebulun. And verse 31, neither did Asher. And verse 33, neither did Naphtali. All the tribes. And what happened? 
And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would not allow them to come down to the valley. Isn't Dan one of the, the tribes of Israel? What happened? Why did they fail? Disobedience. We are told twice that everyone did as he saw fit. He's captured the lifestyle which we see today, just like it was in the days of Israel. What does the world, society, ground itself upon? Individualism is now the god of today's society. Self-fulfillment and self-gratification is the standard, the morals of today's world. And just look at what is happening in our own backyard. The local jail has increased in size. Young teens committing murder and facing terrorism charges. Where are our morals today? The only certain basics for ethics, for morality, is on the character and the word of God. It is on God's standard that we are judged, not on our own worldly standard. And in our reading this morning, Paul established that we will die, we that we've died with Christ to the eternal spiritual forces or basic principles of this world. Then he asks a very important question. Why do you keep on following the rules of this world? He noticed that the people of his time were lapsing into a legalistic form of religion. Does it point also to our very world today? I truly believe that Paul would ask this very same question of us today. Paul further goes on and says, These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. Paul continues in chapter 4 of Colossians, turning his focus to Christ. Set your sights on the things above, where Christ is. We are to put to death whatever belongs to our earthly nature, our sinful nature, our sinful tendencies. This may include what the world would tell you is worship of religion. Look how our moral standards have changed over the years, over the decades, over the generations. Instead, we are guided by the Holy Spirit to turn to God's standard, for that is the only way we can change our behaviour. And from there we can influence those who are around us. Let's pray. Almighty Father, we thank you that we can look through your Bible, that we can see that your word is still relevant today. Lord, teach us that we may become more like your Son, Jesus Christ, and that we may be like him to influence those around us to seek him, to seek you, and from that influence that we may change the world in your name to glorify you in all. Father, we thank you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.